Good morning, church. Elisa, Mark, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We please that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's word through the Sabbath school lesson. Mark, will you pray for God's blessing on this morning? Sure, study? sure. Thank you. Dear Lord, we are uh, excited to get into your word this morning, this Sabbath day, and listen to what you have to show us about love Amen. and how to show and love you. Um, be with each of us, all the members online. Help us to, to discern it, understand it, internalize it, and use it to spread your word to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you. Uh, this quarter's lesson looks at Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, topically. Uh, these cover such themes as the everlasting covenant, law and grace, what it means to love God and our neighbor, and most important of all, how Deuteronomy reveals to us the love of God, which was most powerfully made manifest in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. Today's lesson is going to touch a little bit on one of those topics. This week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, To Love the Lord Your God. And so the memory text, the key text, is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5. And I, I, I tell you right now that we are going, the three of us, are going to talk a little bit about that, that very verse. So here's what the, 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 memory, the, the memory text tells us. Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And I'm, I'm just going to, um, to take a couple of uh, sentences, um, and I'm going to just expand a little bit on that, just a little bit. We shall love the Lord, says uh, Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy speaking with, to Israel, and they're at the borders of Canaan. You shall love the Lord. The Hebrew word used here to describe love is a general term that also suggests a desire to love an affection to love, an inclination to love. And when we have a desire, an affection, and an inclination to love God, we established an intimate cleaving of soul to soul. In other words, we become intimately attached. That's part of what the Lord is saying. The believer's relationship to God is based on love. We love him because he first loved us, says uh, John in 1 John 4.19. As John tells us in uh, John chapter 14 and 15, to love perfectly is to obey wholeheartedly. But that verse also tells us to love, uh, to, to love the Lord our God with all our heart. The Hebrew word used here to describe heart generally refers to to the motives, to the affections, to the feelings, to the desires, and to the will. The heart is the source of action and the center of thought and feeling. Christianity calls for all that the human being is and has to offer, all that you are and have to offer, the mind, the affection, and the capacity for action. Now, a brief overview of, of the, the week's Sabbath school lesson. In the Hebrew scripture, uh, uh, the word love appears mostly in the books of Deuteronomy and the Song of Songs, Solomon's written book. Because the book of Deuteronomy is essentially about covenant, in other words, it is about the relationship between God and these people, you and I, Love is an important theme of this book. Unfortunately, however, the book of Deuteronomy does not contain a clear definition of love. And why? Well, love is mysterious, and it is beyond your understanding and my understanding. And so Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, Ephesians 3, 17, 19, that you and I, being rooted 
and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, is beyond knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Love that is rooted, and I'm going back to that verse, love that is rooted, verse 17, goes down deep into, into the soil of the soul, engaging all the faculties of the mind, while love that is grounded is the firm foundation on which all our relationships exist. There is no argument against love of this kind, because there is nothing greater. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 13, and where he ends that chapter saying, And now, abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Christ's love is beyond the knowledge of humankind because it is infinite and free, never exhausted, forever presenting new fields of understanding. Love springs directly from the experience of possessing the indwelling Christ. You and I possessing the indwelling Christ and becomes the rooting and grounding of the unity between God and human beings and between us and our fellow human beings. The more we get acquainted with God's word and with God himself, the greater is our understanding that love appears associated with God, with fear, and we're talking about reverence and respect, and with God's law. In this week's lesson, we will discuss three complex themes and the difficult questions that are associated with each of these. One of these themes is love and God. What is love, we ask? If God chose his people because he loved them, not because they loved him, then what is love? If love begun with God and has no cause in the object of love, if God has no cause in the object of love, well, why does God love? In response, from you and from me as human beings, our human point of view, how can we love a God whom we cannot see? What about this theme of love and fear? If there is no fear in love, and the Bible tells us so in 1 John 4.18, then how can we love God and fear Him at the same time? What about love and the law? How can we love God freely when we are commanded to love Him? How can we reconcile the imperative and legalistic aspect of, aspect of the law and the spontaneous character of love? Love is spontaneous, and yet the law is imperative and legalistic. So, without any further ado, uh, we are going to begin our discussion, and I'm going to uh, uh, ask Mark to talk about God and God's love. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Um, you know, and I think this section on, on Sunday, for me, it's how do you love God, and why do you love God? And, and I think Victor had a good introduction to Deuteronomy. Up until this point in Deuteronomy, you know, it's kind of a history lesson that's going on to the children of Israel about why they've been in the desert for 40 years. And then he talks about kind of things to prepare them to go into the promised land and those statutes, those commandments that, that he wants the children of Israel to understand, reaffirm, right. before they go into the promised land. So when they get there, they're going to be able to survive yeah. and thrive. And let's read just a, a little bit about this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 to start off here. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, and that you may fear the love of your God, to keep his statutes and all his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. So that was, that's how the Deuteronomy chapter 6 starts out. 
And now, uh, amazingly, kind of on this time where he's been talking about this, now he brings up this concept that we're going to talk so deeply about is love. Amen. And let's read again, and I want to start, we're going to read Deuteronomy's chapter 4 and 5. We're going to do both of them. Uh, our memory text was chapter, was verse 5, but we'll also read Deuteronomy 6 verses 4 and 5, and let's dig into this a little bit about love. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So in chapter, in verse 4, is, it was a, it's neat there. It's a, showing a great proclamation. What is that proclamation? It's right there. The Lord is one. Exactly. The Lord is our God. And I think this is, a, this is a neat start of this. It actually, this first verse be, later becomes the center of a, a Jewish daily worship um, right. um, solution that they do where they emphasize the unity of the Lord, the Lord being one. And, and you know, in the environment where you've got these other countries and believers that are believing in these multiple gods and in the children of Israel, they know the one true God, and this reaffirm that this is their God and the only true God. And, you know, for today, we can talk about that. I mean, what are, you know, we know God today, but there are lots of other possible gods that are out there that we might be following. Um, social media. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> um, materialism. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, uh, you know, physical uh, types of uh, desires. You know, drugs, alcohol, those are things, those are gods that we could be. And what this first section is a reaffirmation, and what the children of Israel did is, and what Moses did here to say is, that we want once again that the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. Now let's get into the real thing, into the, 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 the important one, or the, of not the more important one, it's just the preamble, but the second one is what God is commanding us, to love, you shall love your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. And let's talk about heart. And Victor brought up about it, that heart is from the Hebrew word leb, okay? Mm -hmm. And in the Old Testament at this time, it's more, of course, they, they probably knew about the heart as an organ, but for them, this idea of heart means our will, it's our mind, our consciousness, our emotions, our understanding. It's, more, it's kind of like your brain, but more than our brain. Yep. And let's see what Proverbs 4.23 says about this important part of ourselves. It says, Proverbs 4.23, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Amen. So we learn that God tells us, well, in, in Proverbs, to guard our heart. But he, instead, in this, in this verse, what we're saying is God wants us to fill it with him. So everything coming out, every, everything, our mind, our consciousness is filled with him. He wants us to love with all our, mar our heart. The next one is, so why does he do this? Um, we can get a clue of this, and we're going to learn more about this in our lesson by Jeremiah 29, verses 13, that says, you, you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Right. Interesting, all your heart. <laughs> exactly. And what are you going to do? You're going to find God. Yeah. Okay. God already knew at the beginning that by following these laws, that wasn't enough. And I think that's what he's saying here. The laws themselves weren't enough. We have to seek him with all our heart. Mm -hmm. The next thing he says is that we need to love God with all our soul. And let's read about soul. Soul is from the Hebrew word nepas. It's, it's said a lot of times in the Old Testament. And we first hear about soul from the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Let's read what it says. The Lord God formed man of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Kind of a, li a living being. Right. The state, it's a state of consciousness, a connectious right. connection. And this soul can have feelings, it can be sad, it can be grieved, it can be, rejoy it can be weeping, but God wants it to be filled with him, all your soul. And when you do, when you have that connection with him, we're going to read about, as Victor mentioned about Psalms, some feelings and things that are very attuned to what you do when your heart is filled with God, Let, uh, your soul is filled with God. Let's read Psalms 42 verses 1. 
And as the deer pants for the water brook, so, the, so pants my soul for you, O God. Amen. And then I'll read Psalms um, 119, verses 20. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. And then in Psalms 63, 1, let's read another one. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So God wants us to love us with all our heart, with all our soul. And the other one is strength. In my mind, strength is not how, you know, pick this table up. In my mind, and I think what we're going to read about it is that it's, it's, the, it's where we put our focus. It's where our intensity is. A contemporary way of thinking about this is about it's mainly not only our physical capabilities, but our mental capacity to overcome obstacles. In our daily walk, when we're overcoming obstacles, God wants us to have him in there showing strength with him, Amen. for him. Um, intensity that he wants us with that. And why does he do this? Okay, we're going to learn more and focus on it more, but in John 4, verses 7, it says, once again, 1 John verses 4, verses 7, it says, gives us another hint. Beloved, let us love one another, love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who, lo- who love is born of God and knows God. God wants us to know him. Amen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. That's significant. And, and really what we are saying, we've got to love, we, we've got to love God, and it's got to be a decision of the heart, cognitively, with that God-given power mm. to do so yeah. on a day-to-day exactly. basis. Mm-hmm. Now, Elisa, uh, Mondays has an interesting, interesting title, mm. To Fear God. Mm-hmm. Unpack that for us. Okay. Well, we just had a very rich discussion about what it means to love God uh, with all our heart, soul, and strength. But we could never exhaust that topic. Right. And, and we'll be studying that for eternity with him. Um, So that's something to think about. But to love God was not the only command that Moses gave Israel. He also commanded them to fear God. Mm -hmm. So to fear God then is part of our duty toward God. And it defines an aspect of our relationship towards him. So Victor, you had asked a question in the beginning, can a person love and fear God at the same time? So what does it mean to fear God? Let's read Deuteronomy 10 verse 12 to learn a little bit more about how love and fear relate to each other and work in harmony in our relationship with God. And the text reads, And now Israel... What doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul? So there's a good hint there because all of those elements are strung together. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're not disconnected. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a simple thought that goes together, but one to um, contemplate. That Hebrew word there for fear is yare. It means to revere, to stand in awe of, to honor and respect. It can also mean to be afraid. (laughs) So it's something to really contemplate what does it mean to fear God. And if you're on the side of God and you love him, and you're obeying his commands, the being afraid does not have the same context no. as if you are outside of his will. That is correct. And so later on in the lesson, we'll even talk about in Revelation 14, mm-hmm. where the command at the end of time is to fear, fear God, God and give glory to, to him. him. Because mm-hmm. a universe has forgotten to fear God. Yeah. Right, so to better understand how we can fear and love God at the same time, we should examine God's relationship toward us to give us the proper context. So I'd like to, for us to go to Jeremiah 7.23. 
And in that text, God commands us to obey his voice and he will be our God, to walk in all the ways he commands that it may be well with us. He wants us to prosper. He wants to give us a good life. And we do that by being within his will. In Matthew eleven twenty nine and 30, the Bible says, Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Those were Jesus' words. And, you know, he's, he's letting us know that being in a relationship with him and being obedient to his law is not burdensome. It's actually the opposite. Correct. Right? Correct. He, he created us to worship and to worship him. Um, I'd also like us to go to Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, because in this passage here, we're going to read of the transformative power of God, who through his mercy and love towards us, gives us a new life in Christ Jesus. And um, the texts here read, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Mm -hmm. So the natural state of humanity, of mm -hmm. fallen humanity, is really to be at odds with God. Right. And then in verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, Amen. not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. So when we consider the great love of God towards us and his desire to reconcile us back into a relationship with him, not only for our prosperity and well-being on this earth, but also for eternity and our our opportunity to live and reign with him for, for eternity, it's, it's really a thought that we can't comprehend. Um, so in these passages we read, we found a very loving and merciful God who has poured out all of heaven, sending his precious son for us so that we could be reconciled to him. And it is in that context of a living God with this powerful love that we should understand what it means to fear God. In Proverbs 9.10, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. So it is the fear of God that puts our love toward him Amen. in its proper context. Mm -hmm. It is his sovereignty, his supreme authority over all that is in heaven and in earth, that commands our reverence and awe and respect. He is the only being that is worthy of our fear, and it is his power and love towards us that makes it possible for our fallen humanity to love him and to keep his commandments. So I'm going to pass it back over here to you to talk about the commandments. Thank you so much, Elisa. And right. uh, how wonderful it is. I, I hope we can, we can all see the picture. The Lord is saying... I really love you with all my heart, and mm -hmm. I want you to love me back with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, I am your creator, so respect and revere who I am. Amen. It's, it's mm -hmm. just wonderful so mm -hmm. far. All right, Tuesday's lesson really puts 
God's love first, and God's love is first. He first loved us, mm -hmm. and I think that is important. So, in Deuteronomy, Moses told the Israelites repeatedly about God's love for their fathers and for themselves. When you, we read Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy truly is probably one of the scripture, uh, books of Scripture that emphasizes God's love tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, but more than just in words, Moses is reminding the Israelites how the Lord revealed his love through his actions, by his own power, throughout their journey together. Mm -hmm. Here are a few verses. I, I wanna, um, um, I've got about four or five or six verses that I want to uh, concent concentrate on and unpack. All in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 37, um, Moses writes as follows, Because God loved your father, you know, he's, he's talking to the Israelites, because God loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them. And he brought you out of Egypt with his presence. We're talking about God's presence and with his mighty power, God's power. So God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation and that his seed would exist before God forever. God himself brought the Israelites out of Egypt with his mighty power to fulfill his promise. This is love in action. Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7, and now we're going to read verses 8 and verses 13 in chapter 7, but first verses 7, Moses tells us that the Lord did not set his love on you, nor chose you because you were more in numbers than any other people, for you were the least of the peoples. Now that is encouraging. Because if I think that I'm a minority, I really love the fact that Lord looks at me without thinking that I am the least of, of, of these. And so, 200 years later, and this is how relevant the scripture is, 200 years after the promise was given to Abraham, there were only 70 descendants on earth. 70 descendant families. Some of the Bibles talk about seven, 70 men. But really, that's representative of households. Mm -hmm. So 70 families. In Deuteronomy ch uh, chapter 7, verses 8 and 13, Moses tells us how much God loves in action. Let's read it. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Verse 13. And he will love you, and bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your land, your gain, and your new wine, and your oil, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flock, in the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. What are we saying here? These verses, God's, God's saying, God's love is compared to that of a parent for his children. The mighty hand of God is divine power, is used to deliver his people and to strengthen them to fulfill their true destiny. This is seen in the development of Abraham's seed into a mighty nation. In due time, the nation became as the stars of heaven in multitude as we read in chapter, in chapter 10. One more, one, more verse, one more verse. Deuteronomy chapter 20, 23, verses 5. This is a, a verse that those of us who, who are raised in the church will know pretty well. And those of us who read, of course, know very well. It says, Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. But the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. Let's see how God acted here. Moses reminds Israel that God put words into Balaam's mouth that he could not refrain from uttering. It became impossible for Balaam to thrust aside God's blessings and inflict curses on God's people. The curses were turned into blessings. Other examples of God's protecting care. Joseph 
from a slave to prime minister of, of, of Egypt. What about Mordecai and the Jewish people? Saved from a death sentence. What about Daniel and his three companions? Saved from the lion's den and the fiery furnace. God's love in action. The Israelites were God's children and he loved them. Despite their shortcoming, their failures, their sins, God's love for them, for Israel, remained steadfast. A love that was powerfully manifested in his dealings with them. This, is, this should be encouraging for you and for me. Because Amen. that love is the love that God loves. So, as Deuteronomy clearly indicates, there were rules. There were regulations. There were admonitions and warnings to encourage the Jewish nation to obey God's commandments. His judgments and his statutes. And yet, they were first and foremost to love God with all their heart, their soul, and their might. So why should we love God? Why should we love God? You know, 1 John uh, chapter 4, verses 19 tells us that we love him because he first loved us. Mm -hmm. James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 17, that every good gift and every perfect gift is from God, is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights, which whom there is no variation or shadows or tourney. God is constant. What James is telling us in this verse is that God is the originator of all good. And that no man exercises any fine quality that did not come from God. If God had not first loved us, we would not be capable to love. We would have been abandoned in sin and would have produced hate instead of affliction. God's love for us predates our existence. In that the plan of salvation was in place way before the foundation of the world. As Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The desire of ages, and this is a, an incredible passage, the desire of ages, pages 22, Ellen G. White says, the plan for our redemption was not an afterthought. A plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which has been kept in silence through times eternal. And then she finishes with this sentence. It was an unfolding of the principles that form eternal, eternal ages, which, that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's mm. throne. To love someone who already loves us is not unusual. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 19, John is claiming that the love of God for us has resulted not only in our reciprocal love for God, which is natural, but also in a universally loving attitude to, uh, in our part. Mm. We continually love not only God, but all creatures, because of the superlative love of God that we experience every day in our lives. Ellen G. White in Acts of the Apostle, Acts of the Apostle, pages 551, makes the following statement, and I love the statement. Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not an impulse, but a divine principle, a permanent power. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate it or produce it. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns, it is found. We love him because he first loved us. In the heart renewed by divine grace, Love is the ruling principle of action. It modifies the character. It governs 
the, the impulses. It controls the passion and in, enables uh, the affections. This love cherished in the soul sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence, influence on all around. How fortunate we are that God is indeed a God of love, a love so great that he wants, uh, that he, he went to the cross for you and for me, a self-sacrificing love in which, as Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 8, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. You see, my friend and my brother, what an incredible revelation of God's love for us. Let's love God with all our heart, with all our sorrow, soul, and with all our might. Mark, God tells us that if we love him, we need to show that love through obedience. That's right. That's what Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Um, and he said to them during the Last Supper, he changed it a little bit from what Moses actually talked to the, the right. children of Israel. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to we'll talk about it a little bit, just a little bit. He, he took a, an and and replaced it with a comma. That's right. Love and obey. And obey. Love and do my commandments. Let's read in, in Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 right. um, what, and, and dig into this a little bit further about what Moses said to the children of Israel. Therefore know that the love of your God... He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. In fact, I would say today's lesson would be love, love, um, love me and keep my commandments, but we, we're going to bring Jesus in, <laughs> and so Jesus can do what he wants. In Deuteronomy 11, verses, chapter, chapter 11, verses 1, we, we see it again. Let's, let's do another time where... Um, Moses speaks, Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments, Amen. always. You know, it's interesting. You know, it's not love, love me or keep my commandments. Okay? It has to be both. both. It, has to, it doesn't work if it's one. In fact, I would say that if you did not love, without love of God, could we keep our commandments? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's pretty tough. I mean, for exactly. I would say, right. even with love, it's going to be tough. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's exactly. <laughs> but if we didn't have it, we'd be hopeless. Hopeless. Um, we know that the children of Israel had trouble with this too, um, and keeping his commandments, and and we know constantly before this time they had trouble. In fact, the reason they the reason for Deuteronomy and I, was because of. Uh, the children of Israel that had come out from Egypt, been redeemed, had been redeemed from, from uh, God coming out of Egypt. And it was the 12 spies that went into and actually got to look at the, the promised land 40 years earlier. Right. And they came out and they had an opportunity to go into the promised land, but they didn't, they didn't trust God. And as right. a result, um, they, a whole generation passed before we're back again. Amen. And that was a case where they weren't following God's commandments, even though I'm sure... Some even love God. So we have to, the only chance, and God is doing this because we can't just have his commandments. Right. And so miraculously he tells us, he just can't have your commandments. No, you, gotta, you need to love me too. Mm -hmm. But there is a relationship there. There is this love and obey. Okay, that's important. Let's read uh, Deuteronomy 12. Well, Deuteronomy 10 verses 12, which... Um, Elisa mentioned, and we're also going to read verses 13 to talk about this some more. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, mm -hmm. and to keep his commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. It's amazingly that, you know, uh, He's, he's told them about the love, and he says, okay, I need you to love and obey me now. But this is already after he had redeemed them from Egypt. He had already blessed them already. Right. And actually, it hasn't, it, it's the same thing for us today. Exactly. God has already blessed us already exactly. on 
Jesus died on the cross exactly. and our salvation exactly. is secured. He asks us, though, to love and to obey. Exactly. Okay? But by doing this, we are going to get more blessings. It's not like it's, it's done that, you know, that he did this, now we got to do this. Mm -hmm. He promises even greater things ahead of us. And he promised things to the children of Israel, and Moses did during, in Deuteronomy. And we're going to read Deuteronomy 19, verses 9, just one of the promises he's given to children of Israel. And it says, And if you keep all these commandments and do them, which I command you today, to love your Lord, your God, and to walk always in his ways, then you shall add three more cities for yourself besides these three. Amen. But God has promised us much more than just three, cities, three cities, right? Yeah, right? He's promised everlasting life, Amen. right? Mm -hmm. This love is a relationship with him. And in this love relationship with God, he's asked us to do his commandments. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it's pretty simple. Because I think that when you truly love someone, you're going to try to do and, we, and truly love God. You will find that you, it will be easy to obey because you're going to want to do something that pleases them. And if you ever have a trouble, I'm going to sit back. If you have a trouble of following something that you know is right, I'm going to say, we come back in here and we, in this lesson and say, first love God and really understand the relationship. Right. And I think you'll find that it becomes easier. Amen. It'll become easier because it is easy. And what it is, it's a natural progression. Let's read in Psalms, which uh, Psalms uh, which Victor mentioned about another place where they talk a lot about love, in Psalms chapter 19, uh, 119, verses 70, some of the, and we'll read a couple others, but this is one. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. That's right. <laughs> and let's go, chapter 19, 119, verses 97. Oh, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. When you love God, these become mm -hmm. natural. Mm -hmm. It just becomes a natural extension of that love, that mm -hmm. which is obeying. And God has asked us to do that and obey him. This relationship of Jesus is first, that relationship right. followed by the law. God wants us mm -hmm. more than just to obey the commandments, mm -hmm. not more. He wants us to love him so that we may know him. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Absolutely. Um, the commandments when we love God becomes part of that relationship Amen. because mm -hmm. it is a reflection of God's character and his love. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Elisa, Thursday talks about the first commandment. Mm -hmm. and, and the Bible, in a sense, calls it the first commandment mm -hmm. of all mm -hmm. commandments. Yeah. Unpack it. Okay, the first commandment. So by the time that Jesus came on the earth to start his ministry, there was much confusion around the law of God. Mm -hmm. The lesson, in fact, points out that the Jews had added many laws to those of, that were given by Moses, so perhaps over 600. Right. Wow. We often find Jesus debunking these traditions to reveal God's true law, and in essence reveal who God really is, wow. right? That was his mission. Um, in, in Mark 7, 7, Jesus says, How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Mm -hmm. So Jesus really had to come and peel mm -hmm. back the onion, all these mm -hmm. man-made traditions, mm -hmm. to reveal what really was God's law and right. what was the spirit and essence of it. So... Perhaps it's not, you know, surprising of the story that we read about in this lesson of a scribe, someone who had dedicated his life to understanding the law, had studied the law, mm. how it applied to every question. And um, he raised a question up to Jesus and said, what is the first or the greatest of these commandments? So let's take a look at Mark 12, 28 to 30, and read a little bit about this story. And it says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard the reasoning together, and perceived that he, he Jesus, had answered them well, asked Jesus, What is the first commandment of all? Mm -hmm. And Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, one God. Lord. Amen. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy strength. And this is the first commandment. Amen. So Jesus here was quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, which we have read um, through the lesson this week. And um, he summarized literally the first four commandments in that first one. So if you go back and, and look at Exodus 20 sometime and look at the first four commandments, mm -hmm. you will see that they all pertain to our relationship mm -hmm. with God Amen. and what that means. Mm -hmm. And so he summarized it in this one statement. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy strength. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't leave it there. And I'm going to do a little bit of expanding on the theme of, of the lesson today because I think it's important for us to understand uh, our relationship to God also in the context of our relationship with others. Amen. So Jesus goes on to say that the second commandment, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. And that came from Matthew 22, 39, and 40. So in essence, these two sentences summed up the whole law and the prophets, the whole entire scriptures that they had at that time. And Christ really simplified what it meant um, mm -hmm. to, to love God and what his commandments were. So Jesus clearly pointed out that God's law does not change. Amen. No matter how many laws and ordinances man had tried to add or how man tries to change God's law, it, his law does not change. Our duty to God is to love him above all else and demonstrate that by keeping his commandments, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. And that's in John 14, 15. Right. So this is still true for us living in these end times. And uh, we had discussed Revelation 14 a little bit earlier, and that is the third angel's message. And again, you can go back and read, read that. I encourage you to do that. But in Revelation 14, 12, it describes God's faithful as those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And... As we're thinking about this, I want to, you know, kind of summarize and mm -hmm. think about a last thought before mm -hmm. I hand it back to you. Mm -hmm. God laid out for us the proper order mm -hmm. of things. Amen. Love God above all else. Mm -hmm. Love your neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then love self, really, exactly. right? Exactly. The world has turned that upside down. Absolutely. Yeah. The world loves self first. I might love you and be in awe of you, right? right? You might be, you know, right. the, the sports guy that I like to follow right. or, you know, whatever. Right. And so I may revere you a little bit more. But then I put God last. last. Exactly, Elisa. We have turned it around. Yeah. Or yeah. Satan has turned it around. Exactly. And yeah. God is calling us to turn it back around Amen. and make him supreme. Amen. So. Thank you so much, Elisa. And... and and the result of turning that around is a, a world in despair, mm -hmm. chaotic, full of questions and no answers mm -hmm. to the problems mm -hmm. that they face. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mark, any final, uh, final thoughts from uh, Sure. From yeah, I mean, real quick. I mean, Lisa, I, I really resonate with you, the fact that, you know, God just simplifies things so so much. He just, Jesus had a way of just going in, okay, and just going right to the heart of <laughs> yes. things, right? Exactly. <laughs> so I wanted to read a quote from John uh, right. chapter 14, verse 23, that really just kind of, to me, sums up a lot of this lesson and, right. and a lot of things we can learn about it. And let me read that and to do this. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Amen. Amen. Amen, Mark. I, I'm so delighted that you, you both have um, brought the conclusion of the, the lesson to um, loving God and loving our neighbor, because that's really what the statue is all about. Mm -hmm. That's really what God is. Mm -hmm. 
And my appeal to you today and to all of us has a very similar vein. Mm. Our God is a God of love. Jesus' favorite theme was the tenderness and abundant love of God. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, our Lord tells us to love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. Because that's who the Father is. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Mm -hmm. That is our God. Amen. God wants us to be that way. And then in, in Luke chapter 6, verses 35 and 36, Luke 6, 35 and 36, God tells us, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the highest. For he, God, is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. Now, I know that these are sometimes hard instructions uh, for us to really uh, bring in and, and internalize. But I want you to think about this. You see... In, stopping, in, in, in stooping down and washing the feet of his betrayer, and we're talking about Judas Iscariot, Jesus revealed the loving nature of the Father. When we see Jesus feeding the hungry, healing the deaf, giving speech to the dumb, opening the eyes of the blind, Curing the lepers, raising the dead, forgiving sinners, and casting out demons, we see God mingling among human beings. Mm -hmm. God is in your life every day. He is in my life every day. And as He is mingling among you and among me, He brings His life to us. He set us free. He gives us hope. He points us to the restored new earth to come, that which you and I are looking forward and, and looking forward with great, and great love and great anticipation. First John chapter 4, verse 16 tells us, God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. And God in him. You see, when we abide in God and God in us, we established an intimate cleaving of soul to soul. God's soul, our soul, soul mm -hmm. to soul. We become intimately attached. Christ knew the revealing, that, that revealing the precious love of the Father. The precious love of God was the key to bringing people to repentance and to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your incredible love. Amen. A love that is not only expressed on the printed page, but a love that is expressed every day as we journey with you. Lord, a love that ensures that we have a place at the table when we celebrate our coming into the new Jerusalem with you. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you, Lord, that when you abide in our heart when the Holy Spirit occupies the temple which is in which each one of us that our will can be molded into yours 
that you can help us die for self. And that, Lord, our character can be changed. And the light that we shed is yours. The truth that we become and share is yours. And, Lord, the love that we have is truly your love through us. I thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. Father, give us a wonderful Sabbath. Lead our lives. Give us the strength of character to understand that you are the provider of faith and trust. And Lord, that through the Holy Spirit, you will help us obey and keep a relationship with you that is eternal. For we thank you and we love you, Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.